Let's move on to this workshop on making good policy recommendations. So yesterday we looked at your ideas about your research topic and talking about the, the research. And I have emphasized the important second component of the research topic, which is to make good policy recommendations. So this workshop is really about that second component. So I'll start with a couple of volunteers, if someone would like to use their project as an example, because I'll just take a few ideas. People can, sure, some people are a bit nervous about putting forward their ideas. I don't want everyone. But if we have a few ideas, it allows us to tease out um, issues related to your topic and everyone can learn from it. So, you know, like you might say, I want to do this and I'll ask you about it and everyone can learn. So, a few volunteers, um, recap the research question really quickly. Overview of policy analysis and evaluation, frameworks for evaluating the effectiveness of primary policies, tips for making good policy recommendations, and yeah, questions you've got. Sound good? Okay, so, um, summary key points. So, I want to start with um, the summary. Um, evaluating the effectiveness of environmental policy is important in the real world and for government. I've certainly been commissioned a number of times to you know, write up evaluations of different policies. Um, governments do it all the time. It's a you know common part of um, yeah policy work is you know looking at how well we're doing. So yeah, there's work in it. Um, the second point I'd make is that your research paper should choose one of several frameworks for evaluating the effectiveness of environmental policies because one of the components I would really want you to think about is how the overall methodology that you're using and how you are um, logically moving from the questions you've posed to your answers. So having a framework, one of the recognised frameworks for evaluation is really valuable. Um, because it allows you to sit within the wider literature so you can learn about, by, by basically using um, approaches that other people have taken, you draw upon what they have learned and there's a lot of literature about policy analysis. And then third point I'd make um, in summary is making good practical policy recommendations that a government will actually adopt is often really hard. If it was easy, it would already be done. Um, and just telling them to spend more money often doesn't get you anywhere. And then as soon as you start recommending things that might affect, you know, say in an environmental sense, any time you want to make a recommendation that impacts on private landholders doing what they want on their land, there's politi political issues in it. So um, politics can often make things that are pretty obvious improvements in the system in terms of the effectiveness of environmental law, the politics can make them complete no-go areas. Okay, a uh, couple of people who might be happy to have talk about their projects or what they're thinking of. Is there anyone that wants to be brave? Yeah, okay. I literally just thought about this like an hour ago, um, but like clean development mechanism projects in Nepal, maybe on like biogas or something. Clean development mechanisms in Nepal, mm -hmm. yep, and sorry, your name? Queenie. Queenie, okay, Queenie. Um, anyone else? Um, something that you just mentioned earlier um, about it being really hard to get into public policy when there's private landholders. Yep. Um, so maybe one would be exploring like whether there are some environmental issues that could be better handled by the private landowners themselves. Like, could people maybe be better at doing certain environmental things themselves if it affects them. So obviously things like clean air would be difficult, but if it's things like water, they might care more and they might be better at doing it than the government is. Yep. Um, and so are you on name? Devon. Evan. Devon. Devon. And Devon, where are you from? South Africa. Great. And so are you thinking, are you thinking about doing it based on South Africa? Or are you thinking about doing it in Australia? Um, either. I think, yeah, let's say South Africa for interest sake. Yeah. Yep. Okay, and so private um, land management? Private, yeah. yep. That's somewhere else. And Queenie, Sarah, you're from Singapore and you wanted. Uh, like clean development mechanisms. So project. CDMs. Yeah. Okay. 
Anyone else? Chris, I'm thinking about um, land clearing and the politics around that in Queensland, specifically with regard to how Australia accounts for its greenhouse gas reductions. Yep. Okay. Can we have a non-English speaking as a first language person? So someone wants to put the hand up who's thinking, who's not an English... Obviously everyone speaks English, but not as a first language. Yep. Yeah, uh, I was telling you... Uh, right. You're from Colombia? Yep. Yeah. They saw, like you said, this prestige on, on land. Uh, in Colombia, because just yesterday the European Union authorized like the use of this pesticide for yep, five so years. So pollution in Colombia. Yeah. Yep. Like. Cool. And sorry, your name? Juan. Juan. Um, okay. Does that sound like a good spread? So we've got um, pollution in Colombia, um, CDM in Nepal, um, South Africa, private land management, land clearing in Queensland. Does that sound like a good spread? Just gives us a few range of issues to think about. Because, um, yeah, let's just bring them in as we go through in different parts in the workshop, hey? Okay, and obviously if anyone else has got a question related to yours, if you can jump in, but just gives us some things to tease out. Okay, so let's just recap on our what we're doing. So we, there's two parts to the research task. You have to evaluate the effectiveness, so how well it's doing, and evaluate the effectiveness of the implementation of an international environmental regulatory framework in any country of the world, and make two or more policy recommendations for how the implementation can be improved. Um, that second part is what we're really focusing on. Can I just mention also, I don't know if I've made it crystal clear, but I'm really, you can do any international convention, not just the ones we cover in lectures. And also, I'm really flexible with, even if you want to just do broad sustainable development um, or some social issues, um, there's Agenda 21 that we'll talk about, which is a broad framework or broad, not framework, policy document about sustainable development. Um, you can, you can do the Brundtland Report and the implementation of sustainable development. So if you're interested in social and cultural issues, there's plenty of scope there. It doesn't have to be a formal legal convention. I'm happy if you wanted to look at some, as long as you've got an international component and you're looking at the effectiveness of it being achieved, it doesn't have to be a formal convention. Um, so please feel free to scope, you know, choose a project that you is really interesting to you. And I'll, I can give you feedback on that, obviously, when you present your research proposal. So, you know, you can just ask me. Um, okay, so general reference is, yeah, my book, Does Environmental Law Work? Which, yeah, just was my PhD, which was published as a book. Um, and it's freely available at that link. It's on the Blackboard site as well. Um, you know, I'm not... Um, it's just a general reference uh, as, as background. I was interested in how to evaluate the effectiveness of environmental legal systems, and so I looked at different, you know, different approaches. And so the frameworks that um, I'll talk about now really the things that I looked at in my PhD. So there's many national and global well-known evaluations of environmental policy. So GO5, um, I think GO6 came out this year, but the Global Environmental Outlook, basically a big compilation of data on everything from air pollution to climate change to biodiversity loss. Um, so there's plenty of examples of that um, globally and in different national, you know, national reports. Um, can I just pull out a few words of, from the research um, task um, to really think about what they mean? So evaluate effectiveness and policy. So evaluate to ascertain the value of something or to appraise it carefully, just a general dictionary definition. So basically, yeah, is it like you evaluate things all the time, you know? You buy, you know, you buy something and you um, take your first bite and just think, oh, that tastes nice. You're evaluating how good it tastes. So we do it all of the time. Um, effectiveness, 
it serves its purpose or is producing the intended result. So when you look at um, you know, an international convention, you're looking at well, what's it aiming to achieve and then how well is it achieving that objective is the evaluation of it. So intent, serving its purpose or producing the intended result. So in a legal or policy context, if effectiveness can be seen as a measure of how successful the law or framework is in resolving and solving the problem it was designed to address. And policies um, are positions taken and communicated by government that recognise a problem and in general what will be done about it. Um, so sustainable development is a broad, well-known policy um, objective. We want to achieve sustainable development. Um, just give you an overview, there's this whole field built around policy analysis and evaluation. So I think it's chapter two or three of my, um, my book basically is, provides some other, you know, some more detailed analysis of it. But let's just do a quick overview. Just because when you're doing advanced research, it's really important that you recognise the fields of knowledge that you're working within so that you can adopt you learn from people that have come before you because you're not going to be doing something that people have never thought about before. You, you, if you can recognise the area that you're working in and then draw upon the relevant learning of other people, to say draw upon relevant literature sounds wonky and academic. What you're drawing upon is a lot of smart people have come before you and they've thought about similar problems and they've got some ideas that you can draw upon. So identifying the broad area and your topic is within the area of policy analysis and there's a huge amount of literature about policy yeah, analysis and evaluation. So um, Stephen Dovers, there's a second edition to this book, is a really good general reference, um, Environment and Sustainability Policy. Um, and um, in policy um, analysis, they often talk about the policy cycle. So if you, if you start at the bottom, you identify an issue like climate change. Um, you do policy analysis, you know, what sort of mechanisms can we, do, can we deal with, you know, can we do to deal with climate change? And then you identify different things, you, different instruments you might use, laws, you might use economic measures, you might use education, and then you consult with industry and the general community about it. You coordinate your response with, you know, within government and the like. You make a decision on what you want to do, and then you implement it, and then you evaluate it, maybe a couple of years later. So, and then you go back to, you know, have we solved it? So that's the policy cycle. I know my partner, um, Brooke, um, works in government in policy, and she, I've always, uh, you know, talk about the policy cycle, and she says, oh, no, government doesn't work like that at all. It's not anywhere as neat as that. Um, it's all messy, it's all over the place, and no prop yet. Yeah. It is a lot messier than that nice cycle. The idea though with like any model or any simplification is it gives you an idea about um, it, the cycle is still valuable to think about um, even if it's not how it often happens in practice. Um, just because it's a natural, it should be a natural part of, of policy or you know, what government is doing that government looks at what it's doing and thinks, can we do it better? Can we do it more cost effectively? Is what we're doing solving the problem? That, and that happens all of the time, naturally. So all this is doing is putting it within an overall framework and talking at least about you know, uh, an idea of developing good policy rather than just things that are randomly scattered across the floor, but you know, logically developed, well-planned, um, well-coordinated, well-implemented. Um, so policy instruments are tools um, or means used by governments to implement policies and achieve their goals. So just, there's a range of different functional char char categories that are often recognised. So you can have laws um, that are command and control. So you know, don't dump your waste in, uh, in water courses. You know, or it is um, an offence, it is a crime punishable by two years imprisonment or a million dollars um, fine to um, unlawfully dispose of waste into a watercourse. So there you've got a command um, backed by a sanction 
Um, so those are the sort of direct regulation. Typically when you have that sort of, the command and control normally works with prohibit something and then provide a mechanism for it to be authorised. So most um, environmental laws work on that basis. We prohibit, um, say, dumping of, or prohibit an activity and then you provide a mechanism whereby that activity can be approved and that then forces anyone who wants to do that activity to seek government approval, government can assess it, and then if they approve it, they typically approve it subject to conditions about how it's done. So for instance, a large mine, um, you, you, in Queensland you need a mining lease and an environmental authority to carry out a, to, to conduct a large mine. It's unlawful to do a mining activity without those two things. Um, you have to apply, you go through an EIS, people can object. Ultimately, government makes a decision. They might grant your mining lease, subject to conditions such as you have to rehabilitate the land once you finish mining, just as an example. So prohibition together with a system for gaining approval. So command, often called command and control or direct regulation. Um, Self-regulation is basically industry and professional associations doing controlling their own conduct not through direct um, government control. Um, voluntary mechanisms are where individuals basically undertake to do the right thing. Um, education is where you might go out and say, as a government, you're concerned about, you know, well, any issue, let's just say waste disposal, and you go out and you have a campaign. Um, one of the most effective campaigns I've ever seen for waste disposal was um, you might have seen it, Brisbane's had a um, campaign for years about um, livable Brisbane, but one of the really successful campaigns has been about reducing litter going into stormwater that ends up into the, um, ends up flowing into the river and out into Moreton Bay. And I remember distinctly um, standing at a bus shelter years and years ago, and there was this picture of a pelican with a garbage bag wrapped around its neck and dead. It was this really horrible picture. It was black and white and it had this garbage bag wrapped around its neck and it, was, it had obviously strangled to death. And the poster said, when you miss the bin, you hit the bay. Meaning, obviously, if you don't get it in the bin, it ends up going out and killing things. So that's an example of an education campaign. Um, so can you give an example of, of voluntary? Yes, yeah, so a lot of landholder things. So, um, uh, Devon, you're looking at private land, often voluntary, measure, voluntary measures. So government might decide, you know what? Landholders, they're smart. They won't damage their land. We're not going to put, for instance, controls on soil erosion. Because farmers, they know what they're doing. They don't want to lose their soil. So we're not going to control farming practices and a lot of farming practices basically governments have a very hands-off approach you know farmers you can do what you want your land do what you want so that's and essentially by default you're using voluntary you're not requiring them to do certain things you're letting them make the decisions so it's a voluntary measure does that make sense um, also, these things can be used in combination. So in policy analysis, they talked about having um, uh, combinations of different policy instruments. You might use um, a law, but back it with an education campaign um, to you know, educate the, the community that you're regulating about the new law. Um, economic instruments are where you use taxes or something that either imposes a positive or a negative financial incentive. Um, so um, enforceable property rights, a trading market or a taxation are common sort of mechanisms that are used. So you know like pollution control you might impose a tax on the amount of pollutant that you emit or a company emits and then it yeah you can put a price on it and then that yeah drives companies to reduce the costs. So um, free market is another um, category where basically 
you leave it to the property rights and the free market to control environmental impacts unrestricted by government intervention. So those are six broad categories. And your recommendations, for instance, you know, you might have recommendations built around, like if, if say your research, Devon, identifies that um, property holders, there's a problem um, in a particular area, but there's a lot of confusion and lack of information about, you know, a, say a use of a, I don't know, a pesticide or something like that. And you want to, that that's actually might be a better uh, example for you, um, Johan, is, you know, in Colombia, that with your pollution control, you know, you might have an education campaign for um, people using the pesticides um, that, you know, to manage it um, better. So an education campaign might be a com something that you recommend. It's a relatively easy thing to recommend because, you know, you're not imposing restrictions on people. The, the harder ones are the command and control ones because they typically come with political, yeah, political costs. So um, I'll also mention that policy goals, effectiveness is only one goal. Um, efficient, so cost effective, is another goal. So government will often look at, you know, is what we're doing efficient? So not just is it going to achieve our outcome, but, you know, are we just imposing red tape on the community? So cost effectiveness, equity as well. So you shouldn't have, you know, policies that um, are disproportionate. You know, let's just say that they affect a particular part of the community for whatever reason. Um, so say, uh, um, let's just say landholders in the area had, had rights to clear vegetation and then you just come in and you ban clearing. Um, many people would, might regard that as an inequitable. So if you came in and you banned clearing but you also had compensation paid to landholders for loss of property rights. So, you know, dealing with things equitably. Um, and also another one, um, this is from a great book um, about um, smart regulation by Gunningham and Grabowski, this really, really good textbook um, from 1998. Political acceptability is also um, a, a, a goal, even if it's often not talked about in government. But you don't recommend things that you know your government doesn't want to hear. So political acceptability is a goal. I talked about um, seeing policy as a thing of more of gardening rather than engineering or building. Um, I think that that's something useful to bear in mind as well, that you're not going to solve everything with some grand design overnight, that often you're taking the existing policy environment and then building upon it. So yeah, gardening. So frameworks um, for evaluating effectiveness in environmental policies. So the one that I used in, well, it's widely used, um, and my, my PhD was about was the pressure state response method. So it's a basic idea. So if you think about environmental problems, they're really complicated, right? Lots of things going on. So you need some conceptual model to help you make sense of all of this complexity and separate out issues so that you can say something sensible about this messy situation. So pressure state response has been around for decades. Um, it was you and it's been, so state of environment reporting is widely used internationally. The OECD, um, has a state environment reporting framework developed in the 1990s. Um, and the, the idea that the OECD developed was pressure state response. Um, so pressures is something like, say, fishing. It's a human activity that's impacting on the environment. The condition or state, the c condition and state are used interchangeably. So the condition or state is the current physical um, nature of the environment in, in whatever you're looking at. So if you're looking at um, a fishery, let's just say you're looking at the tuna fishery, um, it's the current state but also the trend. So if you've got the pressure is fishing of tuna, the state is that tuna have declined from this level in the 1950s to now they're 10% of their original biomass and they're projected to continue to go lower. So this, the condition would be, you've got a real problem. You're in you know, critical levels, the whole species might be lost. 
So it's not just a point in time, you can include trends as well in condition. Uh, and then response is everything that society is doing about that pressure. So everything from laws and licensing to education campaigns or voluntary measures. So it's not just laws in that component. And so when you're evaluating a law, the response, your question is, is what we're doing likely to alleviate the pressure to the extent that the condition of that, what we're looking at is going to be maintained or improved? And if the answer to that is no, that what we're doing is unlikely to maintain the condition, let's just use the tuna example. Let's just say the tuna have declined to 10% of their original biomass and we're going to allow fishing licenses to take levels of tuna that modelling is saying is going to lead to them being wiped out within five years, then you would say, well, the response where you allow that level of licensing is clearly um, inadequate to protect tuna stocks. So that's an evaluation of its likely effectiveness. You're saying it's inadequate. Does that make sense? Can you see how separating out those issues just helps you get um, and there can be over, you know, there's overlap. It can be difficult to separate out the pressure and condition. Um, and inadequate response can also be a pressure. So it's not, it's not like there's perfectly neat categories, but it's a way of trying to separate out a complex world. Okay, so state environment reporting really began in 1969 in the US with the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, it required the president to produce environmental quality reports and that then led on in 1979 to the OECD um, recommending to member countries to prepare periodic national reports on the state of environment. Again, this is in the context of, remember we talked about the 70s being this, you know, environmental concern, you know, really growing. Um, 1985 was the first Australian state of environment report and then there's been, yeah, multiple reports since then. So this is just an example. In Queens, this is the cover of the Australian State of Environment Report in 2006, and there's one from 2007 in Queensland. So widely adopted in Queensland and around the world. Um, the objectives of it include basically report on the effectiveness of policies and programs. One of the things that I looked at in my PhD was how actually we did that. And what I found was even though it's one of the objectives, in state of environment reporting, they very rarely evaluate. They just normally describe what is the problem and they describe what government is doing about it, but they never complete the loop and actually say, is what government's doing good enough? Um, so it's, they're very descriptive. Um, but at least the idea is that they will evaluate. So can I, yeah, there's a the difference between description and evaluation, you know? Um, is yeah, a fundamental um, idea to understand and I really want you to evaluate, not just describe what the problem is, you've got to evaluate how well the law is doing. Okay, so pressure state response, basic idea. Um, I would just mention in set of environment reporting, environmental indicators are commonly used. So there's a set that the OECD developed and have been widely adopted um, so just as an example, environmental indicator of greenhouse gas concentrations. Um, so indicators, because the world is so complicated, how do you tell if things are changing when there's so many things going on? Well, the idea has been with environmental indicators to develop a, you know, things that we can measure that can tell us how well we're doing. So greenhouse gas concentrations is a, you know, an easy example of that. Um, and some form of risk assessment is really common in state of environment reporting to prioritise the most important threats and pressures. So if let's think about, say, one of um, uh, our, our... Actually, each of our examples was quite... Actually, Devon, let's use yours. So South Africa, private land management in South Africa. So what, what are the sorts of things that you think are leading to degradation in, of land management in South Africa? Um, well, I'd say one of the big issues would be uh, 
an educational aspect where a lot of land has been redistributed to people that aren't necessarily qualified or prepared to take on the land, and therefore yep. overgrazing is a massive concern. So overgrazing, yep. yeah, which is then erosion and also yeah. So that's one pressure. So to, uh, overgrazing now. Can you think of something else, like say use of pesticides? Can we just just yeah. as a second pressure? Yeah. Okay. So you've got two pressures there. Um, so um, a, a bit of a risk assessment might be you look at the total land in South Africa, and you try and work out how much overgrazing. Like pesticides might be a very small component of the overall problem, and overgrazing might be a major component that's leading to a lot of you know land degradation. So that's a simple risk assessment in terms of you know the likelihood and consequences sort of um, of so you would then let's just say you look at different pressures and you say you know in this analysis I'm going to focus on overgrazing and not look at other pressures because overgrazing is clearly the biggest threat to environmental or sorry you know land degradation in you know, of, of private land in South Africa. So a risk assessment, it allows you, so for instance, if other people, is anyone going to look at, no one on our list is just looking at a, a protected area. So is anyone thinking about looking at a protected area? Yep, so what are you thinking of looking at? I was thinking of looking how the VMA is implemented in terms of farming. Sorry, how the, what was look? In vegetation Qu Management So the Vegetation Management Act in Queensland, but a protected, a protected area. So is anyone looking at like the Great Barrier Reef or the Morton Bay Ramsar wetland or thinking about a World Heritage Site in your own country? Yep. Uh, I was thinking about Paraguay, uh, off the west coast of New Zealand. Yep. The west coast of Paraguay? Uh, Paraguay. Sorry? Paraguay. It's all. <laughs> This is not the west coast of BC. No. The west coast of Canada? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and is it a protected area? Yeah. Okay, and what are the threats to it? Um, there's, it there is a marine protected area, um, yep. which is overfishing. So overfishing, yep. Yeah. Um, vessel traffic. So, yeah, marine pollution, ship source marine pollution, yep. Yeah. Um, and Climate change? Yep, and coastal yeah. development. Yeah, coastal development runoff. Yep, so land source marine pollution. So you've got four problems there, and um, in the context of those four, like you might, like, let's just say you're looking at a, you're evaluating, say, Canada's um, implementation of UNCLOS and the Convention of Biological Diversity in protecting this marine protected area, and you're using this as a case study and you separate out the say pressures and you say there's four main pressures um, uh, was it fishing um, land, um, um, ship source pollution, land source pollution and coastal development and climate change and then try and prioritize then in risk assessing that you try and prioritize which are the biggest and then once you identify, say one, say one's outstanding. Let's just say, let's just say, climate change was a massive threat to that marine protected area. Then that would justify you basically focusing on climate change in evaluating the effectiveness of the management of that protected area because you've got all of these pressures, but you've identified what's the main one. So you've done a risk assessment, and then you focus on. Basically, just go after the big fish. No pun intended for a marine protected area, but you know, focus on the big issues, and you can do that logically with a bit of a risk assessment. Cool. Thanks for that. Okay, so variations on state of environment reporting that you see in these sorts of environmental reports. So this is the um, driving forces pressure state impact response um, or DIPSA method. It's widely used in Europe. Um, so. Basically, you see pressures, state, and responses there. So you've got those three elements. But they also put in things like um, driving forces, which might be something like population growth um, or poverty might be a driving force that leads to, say, land clearing as being the pressure or overfishing being the pressure. And then the state is the fishery is collapsing. 
and then your response is still up there. And then, but then they've got also impacts on the health of the ecosystem and the like. I, I personally don't like this because I, I think pressures can be, you know, you can have sort of the direct ones and indirect ones. I don't myself see that there's any real value in using this framework because it's often really difficult to separate between pressures, impact and state and to just find it unnecessarily more complex without actually adding any real value. Um, and often the reports that use this sort of framework don't actually apply it. They sort of talk about this as our concept and then you actually look at the report and they're not talking about these concepts. So I personally prefer pressure state response. Um, Dipsar method though has been used in Queensland so the um, the 2007 Queensland report, they changed from using PSR to using DIPSAR. Um, ironically, I think it was because of something I wrote, but um, leave that aside. Um, so this, here's another variation. Um, the UNEP and the Global Environment Outlook um, in four, the same in five. Um, I know this looks more complicated, but it's not really. Um, so here we've got pressures, here we've got state, here we've got response, and over here we've got drivers and impacts. It's just a more complicated diagram, but if you actually break up the elements, um, you've got pressure state response with those extra things, and then they add in those layers of local, regional, global. Um, now, a framework that is really good to be aware of if you're looking at a particular protected area. So your example from Canada, for instance, um, Mark Hawkins was, uh, uh, he's an, he's an um, emeritus um, professor here um, with the School of Earth Environmental Science. Really lovely guy. Got a number of PhD students, retired from teaching a couple of years ago. He was the lead author in this IUCN approach for evaluating effectiveness um, for protected areas. So anyone that's looking at a individual area, like your, your one in Canada, um, this is a really easy off-the-shelf framework to use. That, um, yeah, so anyone that's looking at, you know, you want to look at a World Heritage Area in your, in your own country, this is a really good one. Um, and it's, has it got another one? You've got, See here, it's sort of got the policy cycle built in here in evaluation, process outputs, outcomes, context, planning, inputs. Um, so, you know, design, planning, adequacy, appropriateness, and delivery. So it's a, it's a sort of policy cycle. Um, and then they, yeah, have um, elements of the management cycle, context, planning, inputs, process, outputs, and outcomes, and what you're focusing on evaluating, and also the criteria that might be used at that level. So, you know, what legislation is in place, what planning is in place, the resources that you've got available for implementing, you know, for protecting the protected area, um, the suitability, the results. So, you know, is your protected area being degraded? Is it well maintained? looking at those different things, and then, yeah, effects of management in relation to it. So you can see how they've broken up management of protected areas, and, and it's a really valuable um, uh, framework. So um, they, they have elements of the pressure state response framework, but they, um, they also have a more detailed approach with specific, that's specific for evaluating protected area management. So this is an example of one of their figures on understanding causes and impacts of threats. So root causes, threat, impact. Um, so climate change down the bottom, or poverty in nearby community, unstable hunting in the protected area, reduction in animal populations. Um, and then they go into these big sort of matrixes, um, big tables, threats and barriers to effective management of protected areas. Um, And yeah, examples of monitoring attributes, indicators, so population of endangered animal attributes, indicators, methods. Um, and yeah, they also have this framework for evaluating the response 
um, to pressures and conditions in terms of management outcomes is very good. Good, fair, poor. Um, so this gives you an off-the-shelf framework to use for evaluation. So yeah, if you're doing a protected area, I'd highly recommend Hawking's. Um, I don't want to drown you in fancy diagrams. Go and have a look at it. If you're doing a protected area, I'd highly recommend Hawking's. Um, so those are frameworks. Um, let's talk about our four examples. So land clearing. Um, the framework that you could use could be something as simple as pressure state response. Um, and that, that then gives you a framework to then look at and make some logical policy recommendations because you've looked at the pressures, you've looked at the current state and what's happening, you've looked at the response, and then if you identify deficiencies in the response, you can then, it logically leads on to um, recommendations flowing out of your analysis. Does that make sense? Um, so pollution, Columbia. Um, again, could be pressure state response. Could be a logical framework to use where you, know, you look at the overall situation, um, you know, the use of this um, pesticide, the impacts or the, the condition that the state in the environment, you know, what the damage it's causing, and then look at how the Colombian government is dealing with it and from that, you, you know, can lead on to some policy recommendations. It might be education, it might be better regulation. Does that, how does that sound? Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Okay. Um, okay, we've got others. I think we talked about private land management. Um, in terms of um, Nepal and uh, clean development mechanism. So a lot of evaluations on, so when we talk about um, climate change, we'll look at, there's a number of flexibility mechanisms that were built into the, um, uh, not the Paris Agreement, the Kyoto Protocol. And one of them was what's called the clean development mechanism, whereby rich countries could pay for, earn credits for pollution reductions that they'd paid for in developing countries. Um, very, very popular in China and India, particularly. A lot of money has been sort of flowed from Germany and you know other rich countries, um, and a, there's been a lot of criticisms of CDM um, built around fraud, pretty well, mm -hmm. with companies doing things. For there's one example of a Chinese company that was earning credits. It was generating this really um, bad greenhouse gas. It was generating it and then um, only to, to then destroy it and earn credits. So, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of criticism of CDM and a lot of evaluations that you can draw upon for that. Um, so, cool. In terms of overall framework, um, it's, yeah, there's plenty out there. The ones I've covered are some, some of the main ones, looking at, you know, big state of environment reports. Um, there's you know, other, you might find a better evaluation framework for that. Um, yeah, when we look at that lecture um, on CDM, there's a, I can probably even just give you a couple of, there's some, been some really good research in that area recently. Cool. Okay, so those are just some frameworks that you might use for policy evaluation. So, um, can you just make some tips for good policy recommendations? So this is you, once you've, so you've used your framework to evaluate the problem that you're dealing with, whether it's, you know, whatever the, the issue is you're dealing with in evaluating its effectiveness, you then have to make two or more policy recommendations. You can make ten, you can make but at least two. Um, so, three things I'd suggest. Um, make them as clear and specific as possible. A numbered list. Um, is very helpful. If you bury your recommendations in your report, because if you think about it this way, if you're writing a report that you want to influence government policy, the more difficult you make it for someone to understand what you're recommending, the less likely it is that they will adopt what you are suggesting. That might seem obvious, but you often see reports where it's really unclear what they're actually saying. You know, what do they recommend? So. Once you've been through your analysis, you might end with a section of, on recommendations. So and you, you, that section might read, you know, based on the analysis in the, in the, in the 
previous sections, um, uh, a number of recommendations um, can be made for how the effectiveness of can be improved for this area. Then number one, um, you know, the national government should adopt an education program targeting farmers for improving management on private land to reduce overgrazing. Let's just say that that was your first recommendation. Nice and clear, you identify who should do it and what they should do. Number two, whatever, there should be a you know, an, an incentive program whereby farmers are paid. Um, you know, you, you can use a whole range of different mechanisms. Whatever you think is a practical um, thing to recommend. Okay, base them on the evidence in your paper. So common, I'm sure that it's going to be a common, the common feedback that we've often given to people in the, in the past is that, um, you know, you have this analysis and these recommendations suddenly plot you know, jump up at the end, but there doesn't seem to be any basis for that in your analysis. So your recommendations should should logically arise from the problems you've found. So, for instance, if looking at say private land management in South Africa, if you know you're talking about overgrazing, and suddenly, you know, in the recommendations, um, you you would say that you know corruption you know, is a massive issue for, you know, the agriculture department and that should be addressed, just as an example, and there's no basis for that at all in your analysis, then that recommendation is just sort of like, where did it come from? The, the recommendation should flow logically from your analysis um, and, yeah, ensure they're as practicable and politically acceptable. So, you know, saying, you know, we should take back the land of any farmers who overgraze their you know, they should be basically taken back, then obviously <laughs> that's going to be politically massively um, controversial. Cool. Any questions on those three recommendations? What do you think? Do we have to describe like how the policy is going to be implemented? Or can we just be like, you guys should do it? <laughs> There's no there's no black and white answer to that. It really depends on your research, you know, how you frame your recommendations and also who you target them at. So um, you might target them at government. Also, some people in the past have looked at, you know, like there was a really lovely lady from um, Thailand um, last year or the year before who worked for a large petrochemical company and she was involved in their greenhouse reporting. And she wrote her report targeted at her company for recommendations for how they could improve their greenhouse reporting. So if you wanted to target it at a particular, like write it as an in-house, like let's just say you work either for a government or for a company, and you want to write it targeting it at your, you know, your company, that's fine. Um, but you know, you, having an audience that you're targeting, not just the general public. Well, you could target the general public if you're writing. If you were thinking you're writing for a journal publication where it's going to be just published, um, you know, there could be things that are. But identifying who should do it makes it you know, clearer, a lot clearer. And yeah. So there's no simple answer. It depends on what you do. Cool. See a lot of people thinking really. So I hope that, yeah, there's lots of things sort of coming together for you. Um, can I, uh, I've put this up I think on the Blackboard site, it's an example of a published paper with clear and specific recommendations based on evidence. It's this really, really sad, sad, sad in so many ways and just makes me bloody angry, this um, article. It was in Conservation Biology last year. The contribution of policy, law, management, research and advocacy failings to the recent extinctions of three Australian vertebrate species. Um, and yeah, it talked about these three species that have just gone extinct. One was the um, Christmas Island skink. This was the last known member of it. Died in May 2016. Um, this was the now extinct Christmas, Christmas Island um, uh, pipstra. Um, and this was what Tim Flannery wrote about in 2012. The Pipstrel's extinction was painful for me. In an attempt to avert it, I met with Peter Garrett, the then Environment Minister, and warned him of the impending loss. 
I brought offers. I had brought offers of assistance and expertise from the Australian Mammal Society to his attention. The society was confident the species could be saved at a cost of perhaps only a few hundred thousand dollars, but Garrett was convinced by the orthodoxy that ecosystems rather than species should be the focus of national conservation effort. And I got the message that nothing would be done. Saving the bat wasn't an impossible mission, it's just that the government and the people of Australia, one of the richest countries on earth, decided it wasn't worth doing. And then the other third species um, was the um, now extinct Bramble, Bam Bramble K. melanies, which is one of the first species um, thought to have gone extinct directly from climate change. It only existed on this little K and um, rising, um, rising um, <coughs> sea levels have basically f um, meant that there's no fresh water on the K and the species has gone extinct. Key factor um, responsible for the extirpation of this population is almost certainly ocean inundation from the low-lying K, very likely on multiple occasions during the last decade, causing dramatic habitat loss and perhaps also direct mortality of individuals. Available information pointed to human-induced climate change being a root cause. Um, significantly, this is probably represents the first recorded mammal extinction due to anthropogenic climate change. Um, and that's from a report written for the Queensland government in 24. Yeah. So these three species would also have been. Sorry, this is just a quote, and this is the bit that I find saddest because in conservation, people often talk about charismatic megafauna. They're the big, sexy, furry, you know, like koalas. Love people, love them. They're cute. They're big. They don't eat people. Charismatic megafauna. Um, so that's the context of. Um, Wynarski saying these three species would also have scored low on any prioritisation that weighted charisma, utility, cultural significance or ecological role. And then he, can you, can you read that or should I open up the paper? Is it too small to read? Um, so it ends the paper with a set of recommendations. I've put the paper up on the Blackboard site too. Um, one, as a fundamental objective, environmental legislation and policy explicitly seeks to prevent extinction of any species. Two, policy and legislation provide a clear chain of accountability, including explicit allocation of personnel and responsibilities for the prevention of extinction. Three, policy and legislation provide an explicit requirement for retrospective public inquiry following any extinction, equivalent to a um, coroner's inquest. Four, the process for listing species as threatened is timely and comprehensive. So bang, 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 all the way down to 15. You guys don't need to do that. This, these guys are international level, you know, career scientists working in conservation. This is an exceptional paper. Um, but it's a really good example of yeah, a numbered list of really clear recommendations that are hard hitting and based upon, I will open up the paper. Um, So here's the paper, it's only 11 pages long, Conservation Biology, um, talks about, you know, the, yeah, I, I've highlighted it, so um, it uses the three case studies, so remember we talked yesterday about case studies might be a really good way for you guys to proceed, so this is three case studies that he's using of extinctions in Australia to say something about other issues. So a case study is often described as a small lens through which you see a bigger picture and allows you to deal with these complicated problems. You know, it keeps it small enough, but if you say they're representative of wider problems, then it allows you to, you know, make wider recommendations. So he uses his three case studies, um, uh, identifies contributing factors, legislation and policy settings, um, yeah. So analysis of it, going through how they did the research, discussion, recommendations, and then there's that table. So a really good paper, um, an example of um, policy evaluation in practice, um, and really hard hitting. And I really like the third one, particularly that when we have an extinction, we should have a public inquiry. How did this happen? Why did it happen? What can we do better? But 
basically we just, oh, you know, too bad, add it to the extinct list. That's, that's pretty well it. Um, is that maybe a jurisdiction issue though? Like, who is in charge of looking after, like, humans have citizenship there or they, like, fall under the jurisdiction of some country? Yep. Whereas animals don't have. Yeah, except that these were all animals that went extinct in Australia. So, you yeah. know, in terms of jurisdiction, they were our responsibility. And in terms of, like, if we were looking at it from the perspective of implementing the, conven the co Convention on Biological Diversity, it happened in our patch. It didn't happen in China, it didn't happen in South Africa, it happened in Australia. Is that legislated though? Like, that. Is, is there any way to actually... I mean, we can all probably agree on that here, but is that in legislation that it states that How do you it mean? is under jurisdiction of Australia because it's in Australia? Like, it seems like common sense, yes, but common mm. sense doesn't always... Um, it, it is simply by the fact that it, they are within Australia, so yeah. we control their activities and we were responsible for their management and we chose to do nothing. So, yeah, so... Um, so don't get bogged down in in that paper but it's just an example of a recent um, paper with a set of recommendations that's the main thing I want you to get from it clear set of recommendations give yourself a numbered list make it really clear is what I'm saying thinking about policy recommendations too I've thought a lot about this because I've written policy evaluations for government um, and learned that you often pull your punches you um, so as an example, a couple of years ago with Mark Hawkins, we were contracted as a group of um, people here at um, UQ, contracted by the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority to do evaluations of what we were doing, um, uh, the Fitzroy catchment. Um, we were looking at fish passage within the Fitzroy catchment and we were looking at, I can't even remember the other thing we were looking at. Anyway, we wrote two reports for Grumpa. But at the time, there was a state government um, that was completely against any controls on private land and um, was very anti-regulation. And when we were contracted to write this consultancy, even though we were supposed to be independent, they basically said, we don't want any recommendations that require you know, regulation. And, so, and we knew that there was no way that they would be accepted if we said, you know, the Queensland government should reintroduce some of the things that they just removed, because they just the Queensland government had just removed a lot of coastal planning. We knew that politically that was impossible. It was not going to happen. So we didn't make any of those recommendations. And I've thought a lot about you know the, the self censorship that occurs in policy writing. It's a real I think it's a real thing. Whether you um, you know, people don't normally say that. You don't normally write a report that says, I recommend these three things. I would have recommended all these other things, but I know you're never going to accept them, so I'm not going to put them in my report. They just say the three things. You don't put in the things that you didn't because you knew they wouldn't be politically acceptable. So I've tried to describe it for you in this diagram. So, and you could think about this when you're looking at your policy recommendations. So... Political acceptability or unacceptability, you can think of like on a spectrum. So politically acceptable will be recommendations that are easy to make and easy to be accepted. They're very practical, they're low cost, they're easy to achieve and likely to be strongly supported politically. So let's just say you recommend um, to, a, to a government that is very supportive of farmers, you recommend that they fund farmers to you know, do something. So you're giving money away. I mean, apart from the cost that that would be to government, that's the bit that it's not perfectly politically acceptable, but um, if you were an education program that's low cost, going out and helping farmers to achieve good outcomes. Low cost, no one's hurt, no restrictions on farmers. Politically, that's a really easy one. Education and research are easy, typically, to recommend. The things that have become increasingly politically unacceptable are impractical, very costly, difficult to implement, and politically impossible. So 
and you get to the point where you even think, should I re even recommend it? Because like you're thinking, I'm going to give this report that I've been contracted to provide to them, and I'd actually like them to implement some of the things that I think are a good idea, but I know if I put, you know, like if you were to recommend to the current Australian government, you know, in climate change, you would say you should have a price on carbon, you know that they're just going to take your report and put it straight through the shredder. Like it's not even going to see the light of day. They'll never publish it, never get implemented. So why do you go there? You know, you might go there because you realise it's a really important issue. Um, but you know, the more you step over that line into politically unacceptable, the harder and harder it gets. And you get to a point where your whole report might be rejected. You don't need to, specifically in your reports, you don't need to deal with the politically acceptable, unacceptable aspects of it. Um, so I I'm just wanted to emphasise to you that it's a real factor. Um, certainly when you actually get to writing for government, thinking about what they will accept and the policy context within, you, within which you're operating is very real consideration. Cool? Okay, so um, thinking about our examples, um, Devon, South Africa, um, private land use, politically acceptable sort of things that you could recommend would be education. Um, what's a politically unacceptable thing that you reckon you could that just would, there's no way that the government would do? Um, well, taking the land back, because it's a democratic society, yep. the land's just been reconciled to most of those people. Yep, through. so taking it back, um, yeah. anything that impacts on private land use is yeah. going to be politically more difficult. Any restrictions you want to place, place on private landholders? Education and research, easy. Restrictions pol carry political costs. Yep. Um, you, uh, one, how about um, in Colombia with pollution? Something that you reckon would be easy to recommend and practical? Education? Okay, so maybe research in, how about, yeah, yeah, how about yeah. you frame it as research into alternative pesticides? Yeah, or, or I don't know, like an organic treatment. Yeah, and so you could frame your recommendation into there needs to be, you know, that there are major problems with these pesticides, there needs to be further research into, you know, this. And I've, like in reports like this one, the ones we wrote for Grumpa, for instance, we found data um, Yep, sorry. Yeah, the main, the main thing with this pesticide is it is linked to the uh, coca cultures, mm -hmm. the crops. So uh, this is basically oriented by the United States. So it's like this pesticide is used like with airplanes yep. on, the, on the coca cult cultivation. Yep. And it is spreads like in the crops. So but what it does is it makes the, the soil um, productive. Yep. So it is linked to this uh, drugs policy. Yep. So I, I, was, I was trying to think how to, how to uh, make, make it like something environmental related. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Because, like, so, it, so yeah, it's wrapped up in, in a whole range of issues in Colombia. Um, to, but that's part of the, you know, the policy environment you're dealing with. So then coming up with practical, um, yeah, practical recommendations, that's just the, the reality of the context you've got to deal with. Yep, cool. Um, Is that an issue of sort of overlapping political agendas where there's like, um, I imagine that like the reason you want to spray the pesticides is because maybe America imports a lot of that. And um, because of that, they want to create a certain pesticide. So there's like legislation that requires the pesticide, mm -hmm. but then there's the environmental sensitivity, so mm -hmm. it's like overlapping.
overlapping yep. concerns. Is that, would that drop it into the realm of political unacceptable? A whole range of issues can be, yeah, make it politically unacceptable. Um, so, yeah. I mainly wanted to bring this up for you because it's not generally talked about in policy analysis, but politics is a big part of it. Um, so, and it doesn't have to be a feature of your reports. You don't have to go there. Um, you can just keep it straight down the line. You know, these are the facts. Don't have to talk about the politics. But certainly, in my experience, it's a it's a big part of um, any recommendations you make to government. Um, yeah, as a policy analyst, you may need to weigh up the importance of a recommendation against it being politically unpalatable. You may choose not to make a re recommendation that you consider is important if you feel it would result in your whole report being discarded by a key decision maker. So, at least that's been my experience. So some policy recommendations can be both extremely important and politically controversial. So this, um, yeah, the Murray-Darling Basin water management. Um, there was a Murray-Darling Basin plan produced a few years ago. It just led to um, extreme um, reactions from the communities that were affected. This is um, people in those communities taking copies of the report and burning it. Um, and it led effectively to the sacking of the Murray-Darling board, the Basin um, Planning Authority, whatever they were called. Mullery Darling Authority, they all resigned and a new lot came in and remade the report that was far less, took far less water for the environment. Um, and even that, if you're looking at the news just at the moment, the ABC has just had a big, like a few months ago, had a big um, an, um, investigative report into um, basically breaches of the Murray Darling Basin Plan and there's this big investigation going on at the moment into um, under enforcement, so the basically capture within the agricultural departments where they're not, they don't want to actually stop farmers from using water. They're basically turning a blind eye to farmers using far more water than are allocated to them under the plan and, and allowing them to operate within it without any um, uh, measures, like any um, record. So basically just saying that, well, there's nothing on the pumps that tell, record how much water has been pumped. So a farmer can pump as much as they want effectively because there's no record. Um, and the agricultural department's basically allowing that to happen. So it's a very controversial area. But even like in that area, you might say, well, an obvious recommendation would be what? What would be an obvious recommendation just based on the facts that I just mentioned? Accountability. Accountability. And Turn that way, make it more practical. Make it more practical, just in the facts I've just said. Requirements that they have that pumps. Yep, that they actually have a measuring device that you can't pump water unless you've got an, a, a working, mm -hmm. a measuring, working device. measuring device. You can't pump. It's something as simple as that. It's actually really controversial. <laughs> it seems strange. But you know, that's a nice practical recommendation because you know, it's straightforward, it's practical, it actually, you know, it's not about further research and you know, it's you're saying something definite. Yep. I think one of the complexities there would be enforcing that, mm -hmm. so especially as a property yep. owner, you no know, one's checking the pumps ever. Potentially, but then also you can get into. I mean, for goodness sake, we are bloody all carrying around mobile phones. I know that in rural areas you mightn't have that, like mobile phone coverage, but bloody have a you know a remotely you know make your devices. So this is one of the things for fishing as well. Um, Australia has been pushing for all fishing vessels to have a vehicle locator um, device operating at all times when you're fishing. So onboard monitoring can be done right now, but a lot of countries resist it. So illegal, unreported fishing, you know, we could do a lot about it. The same with bloody pumping, you know, put it in real-time monitoring. Um, you know, put a little camera in it. You know, you can do all of those things remotely. And as soon as you start to do that, it then you know, makes it a lot harder. Because um, we we're not just talking about a bucket or two of water, we're talking about gigalitres of water. Anyway, that's an aside. Um, you come up with some good practical recommendations. Um, yeah, this is um, one of the reports that we wrote for Grumpa. This was um, 
fish habitat co connectivity case study for the lower Fitzroy Basin. Um, the political context was basically we had a premier at the time talking about basically cooperative um, federalism was basically stupid and in every state's right it was every state's right to seek co a competitive advantage over each other using lower taxes and less regulation to attract business and secure investment. They were completely against any regulation of the farming community. So um, this is just an example of it being changed by the editors. So this is what we proposed. Our recommendation sa section said, we recommend that one, Grumpa approach the management and restoration of fish passage in the Grumpa sorry, the GBR catchment in a similar manner as it did when poor water quality from coastal development and farming was identified as a key pressure in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park um, uh, World Heritage Area in the late 1990s. A long-term collaborative approach is required to restore ecosystem function in the GBR catchment. The initial priority should be monitoring and improving the information available on fish barriers, then prioritising actions to restore fish passage and monitoring their implementation. So that's what we submitted to Grumpa. They then basically edited it, and this is what they published. Potential management actions. Actions that could be taken include the restoration of fish passage in the Great Barrier Reef catchment could be managed in the same. So what have they changed? So we recommend that changes to actions that could be taken include. You're changing how the urgency the recommendation this is what we should do. Less direct, yeah. aren't you? Yeah. Less potentially, oh, you know, like we could It includes do. these things, but, yeah. you know, or you could just go and buy like a packet of chips and sit on the beach and, you know, and, you know, think about it. That's another action you could take as well. They changed it from direct and clear to indirect and less clear. And also, Who's the actor for the second one? Who's got to do it? In our one, who's got to do it? The Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority is being, basically, we're recommending that they approach it in that way. And the way that Grumpa, <laughs> well, it's been edited, is that they're not there anymore. This is just someone somewhere at some time who might want to do it. So um, anyway, we had this big shit fight with Grumpa over this. I said, fuck off, basically. You want to change our report, you can take all our names off it. No. Um, and yeah. In the end, they think, yeah, we had our... Look, it ended up just being this. In the end, we just said, look, publish the bloody thing. But we had this, yeah, big fight over it. They refused to publish it with basically clear recommendations. And yep, in the end, it, it went out as it, you know, as it was. But even that's with self-vetting. So we didn't recommend anything that hard-hitting. Like we're talking about bloody cooperative approach, you know, working with long-term co collaborative approach is required. You know, how soft is that? And even that, they didn't like. Yeah, so, um, this is just an example, just uh, wrapping up now, but I just wanted to give you a few other examples of deciding to jump over the line. Like, not just, you know, not pulling your punches, but just saying, look, Let's just go hard. Let's recommend what we think. So um, there's this uh, stupid bloody Reef 2050 plan. Um, I say stupid. It's, it's so... Everyone recognises climate change is the massive threat to the reef. And we've got a 2050... Reef 2050 plan that basically hardly mentions climate change. It says that's the biggest recommendation. Sorry, that's the biggest threat. And then it talks... All it talks about is water quality. Um, so, whoops political context, you know, this is the time of Tony Abbott. Um, yeah, this was...
basically we gave them some praise, but then we said in our list of recommendations, so notice there's a heading and there's a numbered list and they're meant to be clear. So where possible the um, long-term sustainability plan, I think that's what it was, LTSP, should state quantitative rather than qualitative targets. So that's an easy one. A systems approach to the long-term sustainability of GCR is approach, that's an easy one. Baseline habitat, yep, so they're all easy. Oh, sorry, um, five is where it gets hard. So these are, these are the easy ones early on, and then five is the um, long-term sustainability plan should recognise that the current Australian policy goal of reducing Australia's national emissions of greenhouse gases by 5% on 20, 2000 levels by 2020 assumes a world of 550 parts um, CO2 um, and implicitly accepts global temperature rises of three degrees, which is are likely to cause catastrophic loss. So we're saying that your plan should recognise that your goals are basically going to lead to the loss of the reef. You should recognise that. Then it should recognise that current international policy settings um, also likely internationally likely to so we're saying recognize um, and you should set an objective of going back to 350 parts per million and one degree which is just so completely out of the world for where our current policy settings are it's not just it's not just putting your toe over the line for political unacceptability it's like leaping over the line with you know <laughs> in your pajamas and blaring red saying hey Look at me, we've completely, we've, anyway, it's just going long. Okay, so why we did that? Because they weren't gonna listen anyway. Um, and you know, we've got a group of really good scientists, basically we're saying, you know, this is how, what the science is saying. And we're gonna tell you what you need to do, not what you wanna hear. Um, and yeah, they weren't gonna listen anyway. So, um, but it's a deliberate decision to do that. So for you guys, you don't have to get into any of that sort of political weighing up stuff. I just wanted to flag that it's a reality. Um, yeah, political context, I think we've probably already covered that. Particularly, I mean, the new one's a really good example of private landholders. The political context of regulating private um, land use is always going to be hard. Um, maybe CDM in Nepal, like if you were looking at the issues there may well be fraud associated with um, with that, but there's been a lot of literature on that anyway. Um, so yeah, but the politics, you know, political context um, is going to affect everyone's recommendations. So that's just an overview of policy analysis. Um, Key things I want you to take away. We've got a key. Can I, yeah, summarise with these key points again? I started with these. So, yeah, evaluating effectiveness is important in the real world, um, not just for your research paper. It's a you know really important area. Um, can I emphasise this one that you should choose one of several frameworks? It doesn't have to be pressure state response. It doesn't have to be the Hawking's. Um, uh, IUCN framework if you're doing protected areas, but choose something, look at the literature and choose a framework because it gives you a logical then conceptual basis for your analysis because the situation you're looking at is going to be complex. You need a logical framework within which to place your, your evaluation and yeah, making good practical policy recommendations that a government will actually adopt is often really hard and I think that that's, to me, that's the real challenge I'm giving to you with your research papers, is the policy recommendations. Because, yeah, easy to describe the problem, much harder to come up with a solution that a government will actually adopt. Cool. Any questions? Um, so, are we expected to make a list of the policy recommendations and then justify each policy that we have? There's no, um, uh, hopefully your policy recommendations are logical followed by your analysis. So it's, I'm not suggesting you make them and then justify them afterwards. 
hopefully, you know, with your analysis, you'll have identified, you know, significant pressures. Uh, let's just say you're using PSR. You've identified this particular pressure. You've identified that, you know, that the state is declining and the response is inadequate. And then, you know, trying to address the inadequacies of it and improve it is what your recommendations should be directed at. So hopefully it logically arises out of your analysis. And it may be a section at the end with recommendations one to three or five. Does that make sense? But yeah, I'd have a recommendation section and number them so it's clear. So yeah, good headings, good structure, good conceptual framework, and you'll you know, do really well in terms of the marking criteria. Cool. Does that sound helpful for you guys too in terms of building up? So, and all of these frameworks are not just useful, you know, for this research paper, but, you know, the good, a good research analysis, good conceptual framework, you can apply them in so many other different, not just subjects at uni, but, you know, the reality of the work environment. Cool. No more questions? Okay, well, that's our workshop on policy recommendations. Um, I've covered most of the things that I was going to cover in those supplementary lectures too. I might just do um, a supplementary lecture on how not to do research, um, which is a fun topic. Um, but the key message, I'll just tell you now, the key message in that um, is the, the, the glaring problem that you see in some research is they start with the outcome and then they fit the evidence to reach the outcome. So starting with uh, the thing that you want to say and then working backwards it should th there's a, um, a tension between you know what you think you will end up recommending but also testing it as you go along and I use the example of Bjorn Longborg in that um, supplementary lecture because he's a writer, a Danish writer who's d um, been very controversial and he yeah, seems to me he starts with the outcome that sense of the world's getting better and you know we should all all these environmentalists you know these crazy bad people um, that's the outcome he wants and he fits the evidence to reach that conclusion cool